quietly get your seats, then we'll start. So welcome to October Grand Rounds for the uh, UBC Academic Department of Emergency Medicine. And um, pleased to have you here. Thanks very much for coming. And for those of you on the in the other sites, thanks very much for joining. It looks like we have, how many people do we have on line from their PCs? About 10 other people that are from their PCs, so um, pretty good audience. So I'd like to welcome um, Melanie Riper, um, works at the Columbian, came through our program, there you go. Got lots of friends in the audience. Melanie approached me, um, I don't know, maybe it was in the summertime, I guess, about doing this. And I was, I didn't, didn't know anything about this. I thought, this is fascinating. So um, Melanie has spent a significant amount of time trying to really understand this important societal issue of human trafficking and, and how it relates to us as emergency physicians and to emergency departments. So thank you very much, Melanie, for suggesting it and for coming here, taking the time to talk to us about it and enlighten us. And look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Jim, for that introduction. And thank you all for coming. I recognize you have a very busy schedule, so I appreciate that you're here, and I'm very honored to be here. Um, so just to start, I have a few disclosures. Um, so I have collaborated closely with the Forensics Nursing Service uh, from Fraser Health, um, mostly as a co-presenter to different fr frontline uh, responders, police jurisdictions, healthcare teams, and community groups. Um, in 2016 to 2017, I volunteered for an NGO called the Service Anonymous Foundation that assisted victims from that exited uh, sex work and trafficking. Um, and in, I also volunteered for a project with Ratnak International, and again, an NGO that assists victims of human trafficking in Cambodia. And finally, I briefly sat on a, an RCMP committee, uh, project champion. I no longer sit on that committee. Uh, but basically, it was a committee designated, designed to educate and facilitate collaboration between frontline workers. Um, I no longer sit on that committee. I receive no remuneration for any of these projects, and I don't believe them to be conflicts of interest, but rather to complement today's talk. Um, so now one of our objectives is really to get a human trafficking 101 type talk and to understand what our role as healthcare workers, uh, what that looks like in the setting of this crime. I also want to go through what resources are available to us in, in Vancouver and across the province uh, to assist victims of, traffic, of trafficking. This is a brief outline of what we'll go through today. We will be presenting um, some clinical cases that either myself or um, my colleagues in the Forensics Nursing Service have encountered. We have changed some details to respect confidentiality. So let's go over some basic definitions. Exploitation. Uh, basically, it's simple. It's treating someone unfairly to benefit from their work. Trafficking is when you add the control component. So it's controlling someone uh, with the purpose of, tra to, of exploiting them. Um, often, the term smuggling and human trafficking can be mixed up. Um, when someone is smuggled, they are brought into uh, to another destination. But once arrived at that destination, they're free to do as they please. A traffic person, on the other hand, once arrived at that destination, they are exploited. Often, people think of human trafficking as, um, as people being brought across international borders. And though that does happen, uh, being movement across borders or from destination to destination is not necessary in order to meet the definition of trafficking. So what is human trafficking? Essentially, you need one of, of each of these categories. So in essence, human trafficking occurs when a trafficker will um, commit an act, at least one act against another person, such as recruiting, uh, by uh, at least one means, such as violence, for the purpose of, um, of exploiting them and receiving financial or material benefit through, for example, forced labor. Um, there are different types of human trafficking. In fact, the United Nations Palermo Protocol identifies 15 types of trafficking, um, but I'll just highlight some that are most relevant to our areas of practice today. So sex trafficking is the most common form that we might encounter in healthcare, probably because there's quite a few um, health consequences associated with this form of sexual violence. Um, it can include, but is not limited to, facilitated or controlled prostitution, uh, sexting, pornography, stripping or exotic dancing, um, providing sexual services in massage parlors or truck stops, as well as uh, mail order brides. Child sex trafficking is basically sex trafficking when um, a minor under the age of 19 years old is involved. Forced labor 
Uh, we have identified, well, we as in the Forensics Nursing Service ha has identified forms of this, particularly in farm work um, and factory work, but also in the form of domestic servitude. Um, so nannies that are brought in and um, housekeepers that are exploited. Um, we also see this in areas like factories, restaurants, it's in areas such as mining and drug, la drug labs and many more. As per Larissa Maxwell, the director of Deborah's Gates, which, is, um, which offers anti-human trafficking uh, programs through Salvation Ar Army here in Vancouver, uh, they see about 250 cases a year of human trafficking and a quarter of these are, um, is forced labor. We might see victims of forced criminal activity in our healthcare centers. These patients could be brought in by uh, police or corrections. Um, and though they, they're seen as, um, as criminals, a lot of the times they will be forced into activities such as smuggling or selling drugs, uh, forced stealing. And some victims of trafficking will actually um, purposely commit crimes in order to get out of the situations that they're currently in. And finally, uh, we know that illegal uh, organ donation exists. We have not yet seen a case here um, within our healthcare team. Um, but Canadians do travel to other countries, particularly third world countries, in order to receive organs from um, trafficked persons. Often we will see a victim who experiences more than one form of trafficking. So for instance, there are uh, cases in, in North Vancouver not too long ago uh, where a victim of domestic servitude was actually brought into Canada as a mail order bride um, and experienced severe sexual violence. Uh, so basically she was a victim of sex trafficking and forced labor. We do have to recognize that there are um, individuals who, cho who choose sex work by their own uh, personal agency. Um, but we also have to recognize that uh, sexual exploitation is a spectrum. Um, and often those that work by personal agency have multiple, multiple vulnerability uh, points at which they can lose control and be exploited or trafficked. I'd also like to point out that uh, child prostitutes uh, is really not actually a thing. It's not a term because children cannot consent uh, to sex with an adult. Therefore, uh, a child prostitute is by definition exploited or trafficked. So what are the Canadian laws that... Um, that protect individuals against trafficking. Well, in 2002, the Immigrant, Immigration and Refugee uh, Protection Act, also known as IRPA, was introduced to our criminal code. And this basically prohibits facilitating the coming into Canada of one or more persons by means of abduction, fraud, deception, or use of force or, or coercion. Following this in 2005, human trafficking was added to our criminal code under section 279. And it basically carries uh, penalties of um, maximum of life imprisonment where there is kidnapping, ag aggravated assault, aggravated sexual assault or death of a person. It also includes in its definition um, penalties for trafficking of minors. Um, it prohibits receiving or receiving a material or financial benefit um, from trafficking of individuals. It prohibits removing official documents of another person, and it includes exploitation in its definition. And finally, in 2014, um, the Protection of Communities and Exploited Persons Act was added to our criminal code, which basically targets the demand uh, for trafficking and, um, and sexual exploitation, where it um, makes it prohibit to actual, actually purchase sex in Canada or, or advertise sexual services. So bottom line, it's illegal to buy sex in Canada. So what do we know about trafficking? Well, it's a very lucrative crime. If, you're, uh, if you traffic weapons, for instance, you can only sell that weapon once and, and gain a financial benefit. But for human traffickers, they can sell their victims multiple times. And so uh, victims of human trafficking are a very, a very valuable commodity to their trafficker. Each victim will earn about $260,000 to $280,000 per year for their trafficker. Um, we know that this crime is very underreported, and that's why we don't hear about it very much. Nine out of ten victims will not report to authorities that they are being trafficked or exploited. Why is that? Well, there are many reasons for this. Victims often have a, a great fear of their trafficker. They're very threatened. A lot of the times, victims' family members or pets are threatened. Um, this can be a big barrier. Uh, they have been conditioned to distrust authorities and healthcare workers. 
and a lot of them do have criminal records because they are also invo involved in forced criminal activity, so they're afraid of being arrested. There's a heavy sense of shame and humiliation associated with um, being a victim of trafficking. Um, and a lot of them don't see themselves as victims at all. A lot, as we'll see later in this presentation, many will experience severe uh, sexual and physical abuse as children. And so they see the trafficking situation as the best situation that's available to them. Um, if you're um, trafficked from another country, you may fear deportation. You may not be able to speak English, and this can be a big barrier. And finally, there is a high correlation with um, mental illness and drug addiction. Um, among traffic victims, and this can be a major barrier to reporting as well. We know that the young are targeted. In fact, the average age of entry into prostitution in Canada is 12 to 14 years, and this is getting younger and younger. Why? Well, traffickers identify that children are very easily to scare and manipulate, and unfortunately there is a growing demand for young boys and girls. A lot of uh, this is attributed to the... Um, the objectification of children in the media. Children are made to look um, older and sexier at a, young, at a younger age. And there's also increased accessibility to our children and youth through social media, through the internet. We know that 93% um, of human trafficking victims are actually Canadian born. Um, so a minority of them are, are international. Finally, uh, we know that 88% of victims that are, in, that are in situations of trafficking seek medical care while in captivity, and 68% of these are seen in our emergency departments. In fact, Larissa Maxwell, the, um, the director of, of Deborah's Gates, as I mentioned earlier, has um, mentioned to me that a lot of her victims have seeked um, medical assistance in our emergency departments here in Vancouver and the Lower Mainland over 10 times per victim. So I will share some statistics, but I do have to disclose that it's very difficult to keep accurate statistics when it comes to such a, a clandestine cl crime. Um, as we saw, it's very underreported crime, so these numbers are much lower than, than reality. Um, and there's also a lack of reporting by police officers because currently there is no a protocol for identifying and treating um, victims of trafficking when, when police, um, police officers uh, meet victims. Um, so a lot of these statistics are dependent on reporting by police agencies, and so it's safe to at least double these numbers at a minimum. These statistics are from the RCMP Human Trafficking Coordinator. Um, between 2005 and 17, there were 455 identified cases of human trafficking uh, and 506 accused. There were 420 victims identified in Canada that uh, were trafficked, and of these, a third were underage. So let's go over our first case, and this was a big case for Canada. Um, Reza Mozami was the first convicted human trafficker in British Columbia. He was a 29-year-old, he was 29 at the time of his crime, um, and he was a drug dealer. And Mozami basically um, had 25 victims of human trafficking. The majority of these were minors between the age of 14 to 19 years old. And uh, Mozami really targeted the vulnerable. So he would target youth that were from foster homes, that were homeless, that were in alternate schools. He targeted those that had unwanted pregnancies, that were dropouts, and that were um, that even those that had developmental delays. And he would use extreme violence to control his victims. He was um, convicted of 30 counts of human trafficking and sentenced to 22 hour? years in prison in 2015. He was from Vancouver. He is. He's still alive. Um, let's go over our first clinical case. So this is a case of um, Joyce. She was a 14-year-old female brought into our emergency department. Um, she, had, she was drowsy in class, and so when approached by her teacher, she admitted that she had taken two to three tablets of Valium. Um, teacher called RCMP as well as ambulance, trans and she was transported to our, our community hospital. While being transported, she told EHS that she was depressed and she had um, suicidal thoughts. Um, she was otherwise healthy, but we knew, we knew that she was adopted from Asia at a young age as a toddler, in fact, but that adoption had fallen through and she's now in the foster system. While our nurse was setting her up in, um, in, the acute, in an acute bed, he noticed that she had red marks around her neck. 
And when he asked Joyce about this, and, and her foster must, mother, who is now at her bedside, foster mother answered for her quickly, well, oh, it must be from a tight hoodie. Um, this obviously alerted our nurse, our nurse and he came and um, told me about his concern. So I got Joyce alone. I asked her foster mother to leave the bedside. I did history and a physical. Um, and Joyce explained to me that she had met a 23-year-old man on Facebook who had convinced her to exchange um, sexual services for drugs. And he strangles her during sex. This is um, her physical exam. Her vital signs were stable. She was a little bit drowsy. Um, her relevant findings are, as you see there, she did have bruising around the neck, but no obvious signs of acute airway or vascular injury. Um, a uh, gynecological exam was deferred to our forensics team, um, but her dermatological exam showed that she did have cigarette burns um, as well as thermal burns on her buttocks. Um, so MCFD was called uh, as well as our emergency social worker and uh, RCMP was called as well. We, we contacted the Fraser Health Forensics Nursing Service and um, Joyce received your usual investigations, labs, uh, urine, urine tests, as well as um, STD and pregnancy testing. A CT scan of her neck was done as well, which was nil acute. Um, and she was medically cleared and safely transferred to Surrey Memorial Hospital by RCMP, where she received, um, well, she was certified and she received a forensic exam. So in summary, this is a 14-year-old female who had multiple vulnerabilities who was being sexually exploited. So what are the factors that make you vulnerable to um, exploitation and trafficking? Well, there are multiple, as you can see. We know that people living in poverty are ex especially vulnerable. And unfortunately, in BC, we have a high poverty rate. The child poverty rate in 2014 in BC was 19.8%, uh, which actually exceeds the national average of 18.5%. In British Columbia, the average of poverty is actually quite high at 20.1%. We know that females are two and a half times at higher risk of sexual trafficking than males. However, um, males and boys are highly underrepresented. Uh, particularly, the LGBTQ community is at high risk of sexual violence. But, it, but due to the stigma and lack of appropriate services, um, it's very difficult for these, uh, for these victims to access help. We've talked about age already. The younger you are, the more vulnerable you are. Um, if you have less than a high school education, you're at particularly high risk. Those that are in foster care or that are in institutional care are at high risk. In fact, 50, uh, 50 to 85% in a study, 50 to 85% of sexually exploited youth um, were involved in, had involvement in child welfare. And this makes sense. Children that are in, in, with, in institutional care have a lack of social or emotional support that are um, available in a consistent family setting. And traffickers have identified this and have really tried to create that emotional bonding with these vulnerable um, individuals. If you have a history of child abuse or sexual, uh, either physical or sexual abuse, you're at higher risk. A study of 70 of um, prostituted youth and children showed that 78% of these um, had experienced uh, physical or sexual abuse as children. Substance abuse is highly correlated with trafficking and exploitation, 84 to 90 5% of um, traffic victims have addictions. And finally, in times of um, displacement, so massive displacement of people, for instance, in times of civil unrest or um, natural disasters, we see massive spikes in human trafficking, of human trafficking. In fact, after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, we saw a 200% increase of human trafficking, and we saw similar trends after the recent hurricanes in um, South America and the Caribbean. You can actually find online ads by traffickers trying to lure victims. And I'll read you one. This one is from Hurricane Harvey. Harvey, help. Have a place for a cute girl. Got a real cool study, study lot available. I can hook you up if you're um, cool with staying with me. Please be Hispanic, Asian, or white. Send me pics and info. We see similar trends in... Um, in um, big music events or mass gatherings. So we see, uh, we see this in the Calgary Stampede. And I recently uh, received a letter by the Minister of Public Health saying that they've had to coordinate um, collaborative projects between police, hotels, um, and airports during the Formula One Grand Prix in Montreal. Um, 
So we're recognizing that this is an issue. Finally, uh, minority groups are at high risk. And in Canada, Indigenous women and girls are at extremely high risk. Though the Aboriginal population only make up 4% of the Canadian population, uh, they represent 51% of traffic victims. And of course, if you have a lack of resources, so low, low uh, resource environments um, are, you see, trafficking and uh, exploitation. So our next case is more recent. Michael Bannon, he's a 35-year-old man, originally from Ontario, uh, living in Vancouver. He, um, he actually had a criminal record. He had sexually assaulted a 17-year-old in, in Ontario, and he was convicted of fraud. While he was living in a halfway house in BC, uh, while he was on parole, he lured his first victim of human trafficking. So Bannon was very tech-savvy. He went on Facebook, and he would friend hundreds of, of youth. And, and one by one, he would get, he would lure victims. And once he got his victim, he would invite him or her to, uh, he would encourage him or her to invite their friends to, um, to work for him. He created an atmosphere of inclusiveness, which a lot of these victims lacked in their life. And he acted as their boyfriend, buying them gifts, drugs, expensive clothing. <clears throat> Bannon had um, eight victims, mostly were minors. One was a male, one was a transgender youth. And he ran his highly lucrative, um, his high, highly lucrative operation in Vancouver hotels and condos between 2014 and 15. He would often pull his victims from school, posing as their father. Bannon was sentenced, sentenced to 40, 14 years in prison and a lifetime internet ban. So, how do traffickers lure their victims? Well, let's go back to Psychology 101, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. When, you, when a basic need is not met, this creates a vulnerability. And traffickers have identified this and um, tried to meet these, these needs of their victims. And this creates, uh, this creates a dependence on their, on their trafficker. And this process is called grooming. So when I refer to grooming, it's when someone builds an emotional connection with another person um, with the purpose of gaining their trust uh, to exploit them, abuse them, and traffic them. So there are a few methods that we've identified. I will just highlight a few. The lover boy or the grooming method is the most popular one, the one that you might hear of the most. And it's basically when a trafficker provides emotional affirmation, um, financial assistance, material goods to their victim. They often provide drugs to create addiction. Um, and this creates an emotional and physical dependence on their trafficker called trauma bonding. Uh, and it also explains why victims have trouble leaving their trafficker because they have this dependence. Often, um, victims in this situation don't see themselves as victims at all, and they mm -hmm. believe to be in a loving relationship with their boyfriend or their trafficker. You may have heard of the gorilla method, where victims are grabbed, snatched, kidnapped, beaten. Though this still occurs, it's a lot less than we think, because the lover boy method is just so much more effective. We're seeing more and more of um, high schoolers getting into sex work and luring their friends. Um, into sex work and, and exploitation. Uh, and there's also such a thing as survival sex, which we see a lot in the homeless population and homeless youth, where, um, where individuals will trade shelter food um, for, for sexual services. Experts suggest that a runaway youth will be approached by a trafficker within 72 hours of um, being on the street. So traffickers look for these, um, for these youth at, in, at malls, bus stops, at airports. So our next case is Marcus. He was a 17-year-old, he is a 17-year-old male that was brought into the emergency. EHS found him unconscious in a hotel room. He, they suspected a fentanyl overdose and sepsis. Marcus was, was otherwise healthy, but he uh, is known for polysubstance abuse and he's homeless. His vital signs are as shown, showing um, that he's hypotensive, tachycardic, febrile, he's septic. Um, pertinent findings is that he had tenderness in the lower abdomen and CVA tenderness. He also had track marks on his arm, suggestive of IV drug use. Uh, labs were drawn. He, his urine show, was positive for Luke's nitrites in blood. His urine tox was positive for opiates. His white count was 19 with a left shift. Um, and STD and HIV testing were initiated. Marcus was admitted. He was treated with, fluid, with fluids and antibiotics and antibiotics. 
As his clinical uh, status improved, he was connected with social work. And he admitted that he was kicked out of his home because of drug use. And while he was on the street, he was quickly approached by Kevin, another homeless man who helped him. Um, he helped provide food and shelter. And he quickly introduced drugs to create dependency. So Marcus was using heroin um, and crack cocaine. <clears throat> and Kevin suggests, quickly suggested that Marcus begin selling his body to support his drug habit. Quickly, this relationship turned controlling. Kevin began keeping all the profits. He began using physical and verbal abuse to control Marcus. Um, and finally, Marcus was found unconscious and septic in a hotel room after his last uh, client encounter. So identifying traffic, a traffic person is crucial as, uh, as frontline workers in, in the healthcare system. And when we, look, when we try to identify victims, there are two parts. There are two pieces of the puzzle. There's a traffic person and the accompaniment that brings them in. So when looking at, a, at our patients, we have to realize that each encounter with a trafficked uh, person is critical, as this may be their only opportunity to get help outside of the trafficking process. Victims can look like any other patient that we see in our emergency department. Um, they won't be wearing a sign over their head saying that they're being trafficked. Often they, um, they'll just look like any other patient we see. In fact, I've met victims that were just coming in for ultrasound reports. Um, I've met victims that are coming in with MSK complaints. Um, a lot uh, that were coming in with um, mental health issues such as suicidal ideation and substance-induced psychosis. So it's really important to dig deeper and to try to understand why they're in the emergency department. So what are the red flags to help us identify these victims? Well, a lot, many will come in with sexual reproductive health consequences. Um, so 67% of these victims will experience sexually transmitted disease. 32% have experienced pregnancy. They may come in with intraoral bruising or vulvar perineal bruising. Um, they may have retained foreign bodies, such as gauze or packing, to prevent menstruation. They can have uh, vaginal or anal lacerations. Mm -hmm. However, according to our Fraser Health Forensics Nursing Service, 80% of sexual assault victims actually have no physical findings of sexual trauma. Um, and there's many reasons for this. Our bodies have a, a natural physiological response in the setting of, um, of assault. So um, our, our pelvics will tilt a certain way. Uh, vaginal mucosa heals very quickly because it's a very vascular tissue. So even if we don't see any physical signs of sexual violence, there still, still could have been um, abuse there. Um, mental health, mental illness is highly correlated with trafficking and exploitation. Um, 47 per, a study of trafficked youth showed that 47% of these had um, at least one attempted suicide in the past year. 78% met DSM criteria for PTSD. And as you would imagine, there's a high rate of anxiety and depression. Substance, indu, in, substance abuse is, as we mentioned, highly correlated. Um, 84 to 95% of victims will have addiction. And you might see signs of physical abuse or physical deprivation. Tra traffic victims experience, um, often experience severe abuse. So look for injuries often below the neck because their face needs to be spared for, photo for photos and advertisement. Um, cigarette burns are very common. You can see lacerations, whip marks, bruises, bite marks, um, areas of traumatic alopecia from hair pulling, um, and of course, you know, bruises, fractures, dental fractures are common as well. And we're seeing more and more of strangulation injuries. In the, in the context of labor trafficking, you can, see, um, you can see a lot of workplace injuries. So for instance, effects of, of prolonged um, sun, heat, or cold exposure, as well as vision and hearing impairment from lack of protective gear. Um, when you're looking at a patient, look at what they're wearing. Is their clothing appropriate for the public setting or is it appropriate for the weather? Uh, we see tattoos or other forms of branding. So traffickers like to um, brand their victims. So you can see things like property of, insert name. And often these tattoos will be on the neck, the lower, the underarm, and the lower back, the inner thigh. And um, consider this when you're meeting a temporary foreign worker or a non-English speaking patient. If they don't have MSP or a passport or um, a license, um, 
be, be leery, this is a red flag. And if they're coming in for a work incident, but they don't have WorkSafe BC, uh, it's the same thing. Some of them might be unaware of their geographical surroundings. Um, victims are often moved from location to location by their trafficker, so they may not know their address. They may not have any family or friends in the area. Um, there's a reason why they're displaced frequently. They, there is an allure of fresh faces when it comes to um, business. And by, iso by uh, moving a traffic victim frequently, this isolates them from family and friends and prevents them from building community and reaching out for help. If you have a patient who's constantly using their cell phone um, and texting or talking on the phone during your history or physical, this is a red flag. Uh, if a patient has two cell phones, this is a big red flag. Sometimes they may possess uh, multiple hotel cards or gym passes, uh, lube, condoms, or wipes. And vanilla visa cards are used often because it's really easy to book multiple hotel rooms without having this tracked back to, um, to the trafficker. Um, and as we teach in the setting of child abuse, if a patient's history is vague, it seems scripted or inconsistent, um, if the injury does not match the mechanism described, this is a red flag. If there's a delay in seeking medical care, this is a red flag. So the second piece of the puzzle is the accompaniment. Um, traffickers can be male or female. They can pose as a boyfriend, a husband, a family member, like an aunt or an uncle, or even a father, like uh, Bannon did. Um, if there's a major age discrepancy between the patient and their accompaniment, this is a red flag. While you're looking at the accompaniment, look for signs of controlling behavior. Um, is their accompaniment answering questions for them, refusing to let the patient answer for themselves? If the patient doesn't speak English, are they excluding, uh, excluding them from the conversation and not, not translating? Um, do they seem to be controlling and refusing to leave the bedside of the patient? If the patient requires admission, are they refusing admission? Are they just minimizing the injury? So our role in, in healthcare is huge. Using trauma-informed care is essential. And to be honest, I really didn't know what that meant until I started doing this work. But it's quite simple. It's basically offering um, care that instills a sense of um, dignity, and safety, and reclamation of control to the patient. So expressing empathy. Um, avoid re-traumatizing the, pa the patient through multiple questioning. This is probably not the best patient to send your medical student to see, followed by the resident, followed by yourself, because um, that could be quite traumatizing for them. Asking open-ended questions is very important. Um, this allows the traumatized brain to recall memories that uh, memories and details that were relevant to the patient, making um, information recall a lot more um, available, achievable. Make sure to <clears throat> review their right to confidentiality. As I mentioned, a lot of these victims have been conditioned to fear uh, healthcare workers and authorities. So just reassuring them that they have the right to healthcare regardless of whether or not they want to involve authorities. They can share as much or as little information as they want. This really allows them to feel safe and reclaim a sense of control. <clears throat> Recognizing dissociation is a big thing. So dissociation is basically um, when a patient... In the setting of, of trauma, our brain is actually anesthetized with, um, with substances like oxytocin and natural opioids. And this creates um, kind of a blurry state where the patient set, they might describe feeling like they're in a trance or looking through, they're in a fog or looking through a tunnel. And this can also cause major gaps um, in your memory. And so patients may not recall what important details about uh, the, tra the traumatic event. This can unfortunately be misinterpreted as intoxication or belligerence or an unwillingness to cooperate. And it can also cause a patient to have what, what, we, uh, what we think to be inappropriate responses. So they might be laughing or smiling inappropriately when describing a sexual assault. They might be taking selfies right after a traumatic event. A lot of this is caused by dissociation, but unfortunately it can really damage the credibility of our patients unless we recognize that it is a traumatic response. Um, and finally, expect that each patient will respond to trauma differently. So expect aggression, belligerence, and guarding. Um, and this should not dissuade us from providing excellent care to these patients.
Preparing um, our environment is huge. So recognizing that safety must come first. A lot of these patients face severe threats. So making them a do not announce so that outsiders cannot identify them is very important. Um, doing your history in, a, in your physical in the middle of a busy um, emergency department hallway is probably not the best thing to do. So trying to get them into a closed space uh, where they feel safe. Um, and prepare your patient. Recognize that, as we, as we mentioned earlier, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Some of these victims have not eaten or drank or slept in days. Um, so address their basic needs first. Address their medical needs first and foremost. So treat their medical emergencies, their STDs, uh, treat their injuries and their drug or alcohol withdrawal. Um, all this must take precedence before consideration of forensic and uh, social care. And finally, screen all um, patients that have that show vulnerabilities for trafficking and exploitation. How do we do this? Well, get them alone, separate them from their accompaniment, um, and try to provide, uh, provide a third party non biased translator when they don't speak English. It can be challenging sometimes to separate them from their accompaniment, especially if they're showing controlling behaviors. So there are different techniques you can try, ordering an x-ray for instance, uh, where their accompaniment can't can't follow them, and then using that opportunity to speak with the patient, um, or ordering a urine test and walking them to the bathroom, and taking uh, this opportunity to connect with the patient as well. So there are different um, suggestions to do that. Screening is, is, um, can be challenging, and I provided a list of questions here. They're also available on the DEM website um, as a resource handout. But these, the ones that are highlighted are the ones that I typically use first, so I ask them if they feel safe, um, if anyone's tried to hurt them physically or sexually, or if anyone's forced them to do anything they don't want to do. And some more questions here are available. A 2011 U.S. study um, interviewing 12 traffic victims that, were now, um, that had now been rescued and were survivors, um, half of these victims had mentioned that they had visited um, health care a number of times. And um, none of them had ever been screened or identified by healthcare workers. And finally, uh, we do have to recognize that exiting um, exploitation and trafficking is very difficult. Uh, it can take up to two to ten contacts with a victim before they're ready to exit. And so um, don't be discouraged if they're not willing to accept help, but invite them back. Let them know that this is a safe place for them and they can come back whenever they want. Offer them resources. So um, a lot of these resources will vary depending on your center. So our internal resources, um, a lot of them will look quite the same. So most emergency departments will have a social worker. If you don't have a 24-hour social worker and you meet a patient overnight or after hours, um, do consider a, an overnight stay or even a social admission so that they can connect with their social worker. Social work really, uh, they're our, um, our best friends when it comes to trafficking victims. They know the internal and external resources better than anyone else in the hospital. As mentioned, you, you may have to involve your psychiatrist if there's a mental illness involved, uh, as well as your addiction services. Um, if you can imagine exiting, um, trafficking is challenging, and now you also have to deal with withdrawal and, and dealing with your addiction. So getting these patients started, started on methadone or suboxone can be uh, amazing first steps, and connecting them with... Um, with uh, addiction services is huge. As mentioned, if they don't speak English, get your interpreter involved. Uh, some hospitals will have an Aboriginal health liaison. This is an excellent resource. And most centers will have a, um, a forensic service or a sexual assault service available, um, even if not 24 hours are still often um, present. So within Fraser Health, as I mentioned, we have our forensics nursing service. Um, and they are on call 24 hours. They offer services to um, any forensic, uh, sorry, any Fraser Health Hospital from Burnaby to Hope, as well as um, White Rock to Maple Ridge. And um, the FNS will will see victims that have experienced sexual violence within seven days, and they'll see victims as young as two years old. Um, in Vancouver, you have the Sexual Assault Service. They're also 24 hours. They'll see victims as young as 14 years old. Um, and they do their, their forensics exam at either UBC or VGH. Um, and the, the Fraser Health nurses will do their exam at Surrey or Abbotsford Hospital. Even though you meet a victim who's outside of that seven-day window, these are still great resources to call because they have um, just so much knowledge when it comes to 
what services are available in the community. Um, so please do call them. Externally, we also have a number of services. We have the Office to Combat um, Trafficking in Persons, um, and they're connected with Victim Link. And Victim Link is a number, uh, a 24-hour number that's available to, to anyone. Um, and they are all trained in the area of human trafficking, and they know what resources are available in communities across British Columbia for victims. Victim services um, is available through most police jurisdictions, so RCMP, VPD, um, New West Police, etc. However, in order to access uh, victim services, you do have to involve authorities. Um, and so this is dependent on patients' consent uh, as to whether or not they'd like, to, they'd like for you to call police. Um, the only exception to this, of course, are children. If you have a minor less than 19 years old who has been, who's, you suspect has been, is being exploited or trafficked, then we are mandated to call the Ministry of Child and Family Development, MCFD, as well as our local our RCMP, usually, or police. Um, all of these victims will require safe housing and shelter. And in fact, in 2009, Deborah's Gates was opened. It's an extension of the Salvation Army, and they're located here in Vancouver, but uh, the location is unknown for safety reasons. And they have quite a few um, programs. Notably, the residential program is offered to victims that are facing a real threat of violence. It's a residential program that offers wraparound care uh, in an unknown, unknown location. Uh, but they also have the New Hope Outreach uh, Program, which is a 24-hour um, line that you can call. And these, um, these workers um, will offer case coordination and case management for upward of 250 victims a year. Um, so they will uh, be the first point of contact for victims in um, anywhere across, not just British Columbia, but across Canada. Finally, you do have your uh, local police jurisdictions as well as RCMP. Um, in Vancouver, we have the counter-exploitation unit. The sergeant of that unit is Glenn Burchart. He uh, is very knowledgeable in the area of trafficking. That's basically all that they do. And though he only services the Vancouver region, he is available um, to contact should you have any questions or should the police jurisdiction that you're working with have any questions and want any guidance. He's happy to, to chat with them. Um, and we do have an RCMP human trafficking coordinator. I do want to mention, though, that I don't actually think it's our job as emergency physicians to, um, to contact authorities. This usually isn't the first step when encountering a trafficking victim, unless, of course, they ask for it. But often um, this, is, this is a process, and police involvement will occur later on in, in the, um, the rehabilitation process. Um, so I really do encourage a social admission for a lot of these patients, if they're willing, um, and, and social worker can coordinate connection with authorities uh, during their stay. Um, and of course, if you meet a child or a youth that's being trafficked, we have to call MCFD. Finally, the Chrysalis is a 24-hour um, phone line that we can offer to victims. Uh, they can call anonymously, and, um, and the workers of this line will offer guidance and help um, to anyone who calls that could be experiencing sexual violence or trafficking. Finally, the Forensics Nursing Service um, has created this online module, um, and it's available to everyone, not just Fraser Health workers. It's available through their Forensics Nursing website, um, and it's, it's about a 30-minute module, and it's designed for healthcare workers, and there are, there are instructions on how to access uh, this learning module um, on the DEM website. So finally, I'd be remiss not to uh, thank Tara Wilkie and Lorena Dodd from the Forensics Nursing Service who have helped me create this presentation as well as Larissa Maxwell from Deborah's Gates. I have a number of references if you're interested in more reading. Um, and finally, um, just links to access some of the handouts that I mentioned uh, during this presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions or take any comments. And I'll be sticking around afterwards as well if you'd like to speak more in the hallway. Thank you very much. Questions? Yep, in the back. Thank you for that presentation. I think. Yep, I think it's on. <laughs> um, this topic is so 
a little understood, so I appreciate you coming to speak to us. In your conversation about trauma-informed care, you mentioned reviewing the patient's confi confidentiality um, rights and to make them feel safe and get them to talk to you, basically. And then you also mentioned youth, how we have to contact MCFD if there's any um, thoughts of sexual violence, et cetera. So I'm just wondering how, how you can keep both of those in mind when treating a youth. So when you can't tell them that everything that they say is confidential because really it may have to be um, shared. Yeah. So I'm just wondering how you, how you manage that in the English yeah. department. That's a great question. In fact, I thought about that question quite a bit because I feel like with that particular, the first case that I presented with Joyce, um, I didn't do so well with reviewing um, her right to confidentiality and touching base on that. So um, really spent some time exploring that. I think even though I, I usually will, I, what I would recommend, and of course I'm not an expert in this area, so um, keep that in mind, but um, I recommend that uh, I'll let them know that as as an emergency physician, um, I'm mandated to report this to the ministry. Um, but I'll also let them know that they have the right to share as much or as little information as they want. And they also have the right um, to consent to a forensics exam. So just because they're less than 19 years old does not mean that everything will be forced upon them. Um, so I try very hard to um, <laughs> give them a, still instill in them a sense of control um, over their, their care. Um, and so that's what I would recommend in that particular situation. And also, have, especially when they're young, having um, someone that they trust sit with them and go through, them, go through this process with them. Um, so if it's a trusted family member or friend, if that's available. And if not, MCFD will often um, send over a social worker, um, especially if this patient has, is already known to the ministry. To, uh, to the ministry. Then there will usually be a social worker that they've already liaised with. Um, so often they'll send someone to walk them through that process so that it's not as, um, it's not as scary. Yep. Oh, thanks, Mel, for a really important talk. Um, my question is for patients with red flags um, that you highly suspect abuse, are there any services that you're automatically calling to come speak with a patient on, on the premise that they might be... Um, too afraid to or to agree or request those services themselves. Yeah. Um, just because this reminds me of a case I saw at RCH where this transgender male who was clearly being abused by his girlfriend, um, but he was, we asked if he wanted to speak with social work, but he was very clearly afraid of saying anything, and mm. this had happened before for him, and he, we ended up sending him home with no real connections because yeah. he never said no when he was an, an adult. So I'm just wondering if there's any, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I don't want to discourage you, but I want to be real that a lot of the times when we meet these patients in our emergency department, they will refuse to be to see social worker. They will refuse to be connected um, because it takes a, a lot of contacts often before they're willing to accept help. And so not to get discouraged by, you know, by pursuing them. Um, but usually what I do in those situations, it sounds like you did all the right things. So you, you, um, you offer a social worker often... Um, it, at Fraser Health, we have the privilege of having the forensics nursing service. Um, so often I'll give them a call uh, without necessarily um, sharing patient information. Um, and I've, I've just gotten to know what resources are available in my healthcare setting. So within Fraser Health, for instance, we have the Embrace Clinic, which is a, uh, a medical clinic available to, um, to women who are involved in sex work or involved, who have been um, experienced sexual violence, etc. And they're... Um, so I often refer to that clinic, and they offer the medical support. So basically following up on STD testing, um, et cetera. Uh, and then we also have, again, within Fraser Health, the Surrey, um, Surrey Women's, Women's Center, and they offer the social uh, follow-up to that. And so I've gotten to know what resources are available in my setting. Um, and so it's, it's really, if, if, you're, if you can, making that effort to know what's available in your emergency department so that you can give them those resources. Um, and often there are, you know, pamphlets or um, even little cards that look like gift cards that you can hand out to patients that will have number for help in the back. We have that at Fraser Health. I give those to patients so that they know that they can call those numbers when they're ready to access help. Uh, and I always invite them back. Um, and I have had patients um, that I've met that, that were being trafficked but just not ready to accept help. And they came back to the emergency department asking uh, for me, knowing that it was a safe place. And not that I'm, I'm anything special, but really they felt safe enough to come back. Uh, which is huge. Uh, 
So just inviting them back and letting them know that emergency is a safe place for them. Anything else? Any other questions? Any, any questions from other sites? Wave your hand so you're pretty small on the screen so we can see you. Doesn't look like it. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me. Melanie, thank, thank you once again for bringing this to our attention. It's such a, it's such a tragedy. I think through my career, the number of, of patients probably that have slipped through my fingers without me being triggered to think of what really is going on and you know deal with the issue at hand, but not the underlying cause of that. And, and um, I think this is fantastic. We'll all be much more alert for it, and it'll help a lot. So thanks, Jim. Thanks very much for your interest in this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and now a little break, and then be uh, St. Paul's Grand Rounds. Um, for those of you that haven't signed in, staff people, please sign in, and uh, I'm going to bug you again for evaluation. Hey, Doug Schneck. Connor. Yeah, you too. Okay, am I going first? Yeah, otherwise, if I go to I can sacrifice this. Okay. Um, so you only just want to make this 25 minutes, okay? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. What's up? Yeah. 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 Yeah.